Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, wherever you are in the world. Good morning, good evening, uh, good afternoon. Uh, we are delighted to have Michelle uh, Egger from the CEO of Biomilk. Uh, today's session on putting the planet on a pandemic diet. We're going to talk about uh, breastless breast milk, essentially, uh, or milk that's uh, breast milk that's made without uh, in, in, in a lab. So that's what we're going to talk about with Michelle. Super excited to talk to her. Uh, she's uh, she and her co-founder, uh, Leila, have done a, a fabulous job of getting $3.5 million of seed funding from Breakthrough Ventures. Uh, so we're going to hopefully have a very interesting conversation around uh, science, biology, food, and of course, breast milk. So, uh, Michelle, welcome to Pandemic Funding. Thank Trade. you. Thanks for having me. Oh, you, you're more than welcome. So tell us a little bit about sort of, uh, you know, the both of your inspiration, first of all, how you met uh, your co-founder and sort of how did you it, it essentially pick this as uh, something to, you know, spend your life, uh, you know, bring into the world? Yeah. Well, I've always had two core passions in life, um, which was feeding other people. I've always loved to cook. I've always loved food. It was not a surprise when I became a food scientist, to anyone in my family. Um, and I've always had a deep passion for finding ways to make people's lives better. Um, I, I've always volunteered pretty extensively and felt like I've been very lucky in the opportunities I've been granted in my life and tried to find ways to give back. And so, um, you know, fast forward, I was trained as a food scientist at Purdue University. I graduated, I came out, I worked um, for a couple of different places, landed my longest period at General Mills. I was in their um, dairy commercialization and fermentation group and, you know, everything from making a strawberry yogurt, like tastes like fresh strawberries instead of candied strawberries to novel exopolysaccharide production, huge, large scale fermentation rig design um, and, and a lot more deep tech work than a lot of food scientists get exposure to. And while I loved that work and am a strong dairy believer, I'm, I will never be able to be a vegan. We need cell-based milk as soon as possible because I love cheese and dairy products. Um, it was clear to me that there was a lot more incremental change to be made in the world. I had the opportunity to do pro bono consulting with small and growing businesses throughout Africa, um, mainly in Ethiopia where a lot of my clients. And it was clear that there are so many different developing and emerging parts of the food scene in this world that can be applied novelly where we can leapfrog kind of antiquated technology and move the world forward. Um, and for me, it, it kind of ignited this passion in me that science really needed um, good shepherds, good stewards uh, on the business side. So I actually left my lab coat behind, um, which was which was hard as somebody who loves to cook and dabble, um, and and departed and started my MBA at Duke University in social impact and entrepreneurship. Um, pretty non-traditional for an MBA, not a banker, <laughs> uh, and, and a very distinct set of experiences and paths, including I had the opportunity to work at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and their private sector partnerships team for nutrition. And um, that work was fascinating, looking at plant-based proteins to prevent stunting and malnutrition in newborn infants. Um, so actually looking at conception and beyond in terms of nutritional outcomes. And um, it was the first time I had really been exposed to thinking about applying food technology to, to children, to infants. Uh, you know, we think a lot about making a better burger and see like an adult standing at some street side stall. And uh, I mean, the truth is when you think about malnutrition, food access, food security, it starts really young and you can't really back correct after that first 1000 days or three years of the foundation of nutrition set. Um, and so I, I left the foundation weirdly obsessed with infants and infant nutrition. I'm not a mom. Um, I've, I've never even been, been one of those women who like babysits a lot or like looks very comfortable with babies in her hands. Like I'm, I'm just not, I'm not that gal. And even so I spent all of my free time looking at infant nude formulas, thinking about nutrition, thinking about how this industry kind of deserves disruption. Um, and a mutual friend not knew that I was as obsessed with this as anyone could be and knew Layla was working on milk outside of the body and um, literally proffered it as, I know this crazy woman making milk outside of the body. Do you want to meet her? And like with an <laughs> intro like that, how can you say no, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, and it was, it was like the clouds parted and the heavens sang and it was clear, you know, Layla had been working since 2013 on this technology um, she had been working on it actually at the same time New Harvest was being established. So like met Isha right. and, and that team like in their early, early days. I like to joke, she's like the mother of Cell Ag, even though nobody knew her up until this year. 
Um, and she, she worked on it as a, as a science side hobby, as she liked to call. I mean, she did some odd side jobs and contract work, opened a small lab space here in RTP with her husband and, and just played basically with cells and cellular development. And her PhD had been in fundamental cellular response. Um, and so she had spent a lot of time in her PhD and postdoc just learning all of the biosynthetic pathways of different cells, including mammary cells. Um, and really just got to understand deeply how they worked. Um, she would go to the, the local slaughterhouse and get a hot udder off the line, slip the guy a 20, take it to the lab, dissect, um, and pull cells from it. And I, I think I really credit our success and our, our fast takeoff and that she's she's been working on this for since her first son was born, who's, who's 10 now. So, wow. Um, wow. you know, she, she's really been in this space a long time and thought yeah, deeply and, about utilizing cells for this application. And, uh, you know, we're hoping to have her on the show as well. I mean, but uh, she, I mean, she's been the seed sort of at, at Biomilk, at Perfect Day, and also at Clara Foods, right? So uh, sort of an amazing uh, incubator of, of potentially three huge companies in the future. So uh, it's a very interesting story of hers as well, and New Harvest. So, yeah. Um, I, we were going to ask you about Isha, so that was yeah, that was <laughs> we were actually. Uh, <laughs> it's Isha and I are actually meeting this afternoon, uh, strangely oh. enough, um, which is not in person because you know COVID. But yeah, yeah, but, of course. Uh, yeah, but um, yeah, we have we have some things to catch up on. Um, we're really excited about how many female biotech founders there are out in this world, and so we've been talking about is there some kind of working group or collaboration and trying to figure out what that looks like. I, I'm one of the newcomers to it and I realized very quickly that there are more and more of us and it's it's kind of lonely here. <laughs> yeah. So I was kind of like, I want to talk to more badass ladies. I don't know if I can swear on this, but that's that Actually, just happened. Actually, we should introduce her to Benjamina who we're featuring next month, right? This Benjamina's on my list. Oh, she is? To talk <laughs> to. Yeah, she yeah. is. So she, she's coming Look on the show. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we'll absolutely. Yeah. And then we, we're having some interesting other um, ladies in science, actually. So uh, we have a separate mini series on innovators in innovations. And, and we are astounded ourselves by the number of uh, women in biotechnology and who are doing some fabulous stuff, I mean, across the world. And uh, so we want to, I mean, we want to feature them as well. Uh, our little so, small contribution to women in STEM and, uh, you know, and women entrepreneurs. So I think that'll be yeah. great. So we're looking forward My to it. My, so my mother is a scientist as well um, and, and stayed home to take care of two daughters, but my sister's a PhD plant biologist and, and then there's me. So obviously she had some influence there. Yeah. Um, and I, I like to joke, I was talking to her the other day and I was like, truly like her generation, I think has sprouted just this fascinating, really driven, resilient set of female scientists who just like aren't willing to sit and quietly do lab work. They want to see applications for the work they're doing. And so... I think in some ways, not to say there aren't fa fabulous male biotech entrepreneurs, but I think a lot of women are very impatient to see science doing good. And mm -hmm. so we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of us just kind of emerging out of the woodwork demanding more, which is really exciting. Yeah, so, I mean, I was sort of, you know, going through the, you know, doing some research. I, I think I little know more about breast milk than I ever knew before, before talking to you. <laughs> but but uh, uh, maybe more than I should. But anyway, uh, it was fascinating. <laughs> that it's a, a 45 billion the infant formula market is a 45 billion dollar industry in yeah. almost double uh in by 2036 i think right i think this is a tremendously big number so you know yeah. we're not talking about some offshoot here right i don't think people may have made the connection that 10 percent of all dairy that's produced going to infant formula for example i mean the numbers are quite staggering yeah yeah we so we actually focus less on the number value of what that market is it it can range from like 20 million up to 90 million, depending on who you ask and how you define the products in it. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how big it is because it's big and it's growing fast because of the market drivers that we see. Women are having children later, they're reaching higher levels of educational attainment, they have better access to family planning, um, they tend to have slightly more wealth at the point where they're having children. And so because of that, we see that they're also demanding more. They're going back to work, they're having trouble medically breastfeeding. And instead of in past generations, or even with Layla, my co-founder, you know, the influence has always been, we'll just try harder. Like you're a mother, you should be able to breastfeed biologies with you, just try harder. You should eat these items, you should not do this, you should try that. And the truth is for a lot of women, it's a beautiful experience. And for a lot of women, it's really, really challenging. And so 
um, this, this space and the fact that we see infant formula and people demanding different forms, better quality, higher nutritional level, it's not surprising that this space is growing because we have created a set of societal, socioeconomic, and cultural factors that make breastfeeding in our modern world a challenge. And we celebrate those who can do it. And we're here to support those who, if even if they can't do it exclusively, are looking for other options. So I think, I think on our website, you say four out of five women opt to, to, to take formula. In the, at least, I guess that's a US number. Yeah, yeah, it's about 84% of babies here in the US in the first six months of life receive either partially or exclusively infant formula as a part of their feeding. Uh, and, and that trend is not just limited to the US, it's even higher in other countries around the world. Um, and we see, as we see a growing middle class in some massive countries you may have heard of, right? I mean, we just see these outstanding levels of, of people turning to other options. And today, infant formula, while it can support the life of a child, it's nutritionally suboptimal. It, it doesn't, it, it's a bit strange that humans drink cow's milk to begin with. Um, mm -hmm. And we're the only mammals who do that behavior. And uh, it's even stranger that we then take the most precious beings in our world and give them a subpar option when we produce what is the gold standard, what millions of years of evolution has, has made for us. Right. Um, and so I think, honestly, in some ways, um, we're, we get kind of like righteously angry that technology has not been directed at this space earlier, that we're still using a product that was invented in the 1950s and has been barely innovated against in the past. And so we're basically just making up for lost time by trying to leapfrog component by component or subsidies or, uh, you know, enriching and just saying like, screw that. Why try to make something that's a little bit better when we can just make table stakes, the switch from cow's milk to human milk. Wow. And it, you know, it's funny because with all the, you know, breast milk is best campaigns and I, I've heard it as a guy, uh, I'm, 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 you know, the number is staggering and four to five, 84%, you know, that just, you know, it took me back saying, wow, with all of that sort of, you know, pro breast milk, uh, you know, pro mother's milk sort of campaigns going on globally that, so obviously the, those factors that you mentioned, socioeconomic, uh, environmental, cultural, all of these things, the milieu of issues obviously causing women, uh, you know, not to breastfeed and, and it's a sort of a suboptimal uh, choice that they're making. And I, and I hence see the sort of the problem you're trying to solve. Uh, and I yeah. think that, you know, I mean, given the problem, I think the solution is, is should have, should have come 20 years ago, but I guess we're going to leapfrog that. There are plenty of scientific ladies ready to take it on. That's, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Kathy, you had a question? Yeah. Um, so I noticed that you'd mentioned that you're culturing breast milk from epithelial cells, but I think someone else is doing them through stem cells. Is there a difference in quality or how does that sort of work? So there's some pros and cons to technological advancement in that manner. So we're using primary mammary epithelial cells, which means we can sell, take cell samples directly from an individual uh, if we wanted to and make their exact custom milk, um, male or female, the gender of the cells doesn't matter Not at all, all presently. Yeah. Um, uh, versus stem cells, you know, you're taking it from the milk um, and you're working backwards. You're also trying to get them to differentiate into the cell form and, and the behaviors that you want, which requires quite a bit of genetic manipulation and, and um, heavy lifting on the front end to be able to get those cells to, to act and, and respond as, as similar to mammary cells versus, um, you know, we're able to just take the cells as they are, give them the environment as they would experience in the body outside of the body and then the basic nutrients and hormone required to produce milk. Uh, and, and like I said, I mean, they really, they do the heavy lifting for us. They already have been optimized by millions of years of nutrition to, to be able to produce milk without intermixing with blood. And so we just let them harness that same ability they have in the body outside of the body to produce milk. Um, which in general, I would say, you know, there's definitely pros and cons to each approach, um, but we, Layla's all of her experimental work has mainly been in that that's that original cell line primary or moralized cell line form um, and just their powerhouses of the body they're incredibly prolific they're really resilient they're designed to support all mammalian life on this planet and so um, you know we don't we don't have to work much on convincing them to lactate and then we can focus on what's the end product uh, how are we going to package process uh, get it to consumers instead of having to worry as much about the, the upstream work. 
Sorry, I have a follow-up question, actually. Uh, so you mentioned male or female, it doesn't matter. So <laughs> I think, Larry, did you catch on to that? No, 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 yeah. I caught that, definitely. <laughs> I, I, for me, the question is a little bit different because, I mean, obviously with more same-sex couples having children through surrogacy and things like that, does that mean they can feed their baby their kind of quote-unquote own breast milk? Yeah, yeah, theoretically, we can make milk for anyone from their wow. cells. And, you know, we talk about there's so many benefits to being able to make custom breast milk as a first foray. Uh, there's a lot of women that are, um, that have already reached out to us who are undergoing mastectomy surgery, for instance, they're already having their breast tissue removed. They know breastfeeding is not going to be a possibility for them. And they're like, can you thank my cells? <laughs> can you make milk for me in the future? We have talked to a number of caregivers that are adoptive parents or our um, you know, grandparents caring for, for children and their family. You can think about that there's all these applications where there's something really beautiful about being able to feed something from your body to your child and, and we can help bridge that gap for some people. And you know, long-term for scaling up to be a global brand, we're not gonna be able to offer custom milk forever, um, but it's, it's a good place to start for us in terms of scale up sizing and just consumer work and our initial early adopters kind of getting in on something a bit special. Um, and we see that there's just a lot of benefit for being able to, to talk about equity in feeding between partners. Uh, you know, we, we see a lot of parents, mothers bear the burden of feeding their children just in part because they are the ones who physically have to feed their children if they're breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. uh, and so a lot of parents turn to infant formula to be able to balance that that feeding balance between between caregivers, between parents. And now we're able to reduce even one more hurdle and barrier and, and um, help bring equity to more couples, whether same sex or, or, you know, or not. So it's uh, super exciting. We have lots of people who are like, I want to be the first men's milk. And I'm like, eh, we'll see, we'll see. But uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's kind of novel. And, um, you know, this technology in, in of itself is pretty novel, but that's really not what we care about. We think no matter how cool the tech is, if parents don't trust and believe in what you're doing and know that it's safe and effective, like it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how cool the tech is. And so we think probably an inordinate amount about how we socialize this product, how we talk and co-create with parents uh, and lactation consultants and clinicians and regulatory consultants and, and really think very critically about how we bring this to market so that parents can believe that this is a good product for their children and, and not have any doubt, guilt, shame, stigma, the way they do with any other product that they have to turn to. So uh, just so I understand this, so the, the milk that uh, BioMilk will produce uh, using epithelial cells as opposed to stem cells um, from either male or female mammary uh, epithelial cells, is that going to be, have the sort of the same immune, uh, you know, antibodies and uh, uh, nutrition as well as sort of uh, the microbiome that a mother's milk is, or is this going to be like the next best thing, but not the best thing? Yeah. So we intentionally do not want to compete with breast milk. Breast okay. feeding is a beautiful bonding experience for a lot of mothers. There are benefits in the mother's own body and the biosynthetic pathways that are turned on. We see lower rates of breast cancer and other upregulation in her body that's positive for her. Um, there's a skin to skin contact transfer that is different based on where the mother lives in the world. <laughs> um, so a mother in Mumbai versus a mother in North Carolina has a very different microbiome that she's sharing with her child, both skin to skin and through the antibodies that she serves. And so we see that there are so many layered components there that we have no interest at this point in trying to be a breast milk replacement blanket statement. And so because of that, we've made the intentional choice, even if it would be possible to get closer immunologically to say, low hanging fruit here. Let's just try to transition as many infants as possible away from cow's milk to human milk. Let's get them something nutritionally equivalent that is a prebiotic for their immunological gut development, for their cognitive tissue development, for their muscular tissue development. And let's, let's nutritionally get everybody to steady state as, as close as possible. And then worry about any kind of immunological relevance much further down the road, whether that's us or other companies or groups, because it's, um, it's much harder. Uh, scientists like to pretend we understand the immune system. We don't. Um, <laughs> and especially in breast milk, it is incredibly complicated and there is more that we don't know than we do. And it feels as though, um, you know, if we can get to a place where we can at least say everybody is getting the right nutrition to be able to be successful, now what's next? That's a better place than trying to push past where the frontiers of science 
do you have understanding? I think it's, it's refreshing to sort of hear a scientist actually, uh, you know, be very frank about the, the limitations of the science as we now know it today. I think, I think in the past, maybe because men were running it, <laughs> they were a lot more sort of salesy about that kind of stuff. Oh, you know, what do you, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. We're scientists. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that that sort of mentality uh, obviously is not here. So it's, it's a great and it's refreshing to see actually. Uh, so, you, so, you, so the, the, the nutritionally it, it's as good or uh, is the same. It's just that the immunological stuff is obviously something for the future, potentially. Um, yep, that's our first target, exactly. But if you were to sort of put a sort of a number, uh, compared to dairy-based infant formula, we're talking about a, a huge leapfrog, right? I mean, we're talking a quantum difference here in yeah, terms of uh, everything else. Yeah, I, I, everyone always wants me to say like 100x. And I'm like, I don't know. I Again, conservative scientists here, we're always like, well, can you really quantify how much better? So I'm, I'm not going to put a number on it. But I mean, we, you can comfortably say there are 2,500 components plus produced by mammary cells that are in perfect constellation, which when you say perfect constellation, meaning they're in the exact confirmation, isomeric form, and bioavailable and biodigestible form from the moment they're synthetic, biosynthetically produced by the cells. So like we know that there are all of these components produced exactly how they're supposed to be so that they're the most nutritious and available for a child, for a human, right? Um, and then you look at cow's milk and it's the same, but it's designed for cows. <laughs> and so it is not the same macro and micromolecules. So we're talking about different proteins, different fats, different sugars. It's not the same levels of any of those. So different, I mean, between cow's milk and human's milk protein levels are, are pretty distinctly for, far apart. It's different minerals. Um, it's different precursors and carriers. So, you know, there's a lot of structure function pairs in milk that have, you know, a, a mouthfeel or a viscosity feel or a stabilization character, character along with a nutritional character. And the moment you try to um, try to separate between those two, I mean, it's just astounding how distinctly different every mammalian milk species truly is. Um, and so it's almost like, you can't even truly quantify because it, it is bizarre that we even started in one versus the other and says a lot about how little we've truly understand about understood about nutrition in the past, uh, especially as it pertains to infant nutrition, because we were just looking for the next best closest thing. Um, it's actually interesting. If you look at research, there's quite a, a bit that, that shows that goat's milk is actually more similar in some ways nutritionally to human milk. Um, and yet we ended up with dairy because dairy was commoditized and subsidized throughout the world at the point where we were trying to find alternates. Um, and so, you know, I think like even if you went down and did a massive screening of all different mammalian milks, you might find some similarities between all kinds of species you would never have considered um, because they nutritionally are delivering something similar, even if the end mammal doesn't at all look, act, live in the same biome or, or anything comparable. Um, and so we think human milk for human babies is really where you've got to aim. Yeah, I mean, as a, as a, as as vegans, we say yeah for that one. But <laughs> <laughs> although Lavi and I disagree fundamentally on what he considers to be veganism and what I consider to be veganism. oh really really <laughs> well we were we what, were debating so let's point? ask the question actually so is there any animal product other than humans involved in bio milk? Uh, so at this point, no. Uh, of course, everyone always has their eye to cow's milk. Uh, you know, how can you not from the environmental and sustainability story that has to be walked on? I mean, we're we're at a kind of tipping point, unfortunately, is the word I'm going to use to say about where we are in terms of climate change. And okay. having come out of the dairy industry firsthand, I can tell you, you know, there are, there are many beautiful things about milk production and, and milk products made. There are also some really terrible and pernicious things that occur. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, getting to unit economics basis where you can be competitive with cow's milk is always kind of the holy grail. Um, but we see that there's some other really interesting and, and novel milk approaches as well um, that we're excited about that, um, you know, I, I don't know that I, I, I will say like, we're going to come out with all these crazy milks and we're going to save the snow leopards and we're going to, you know, we'll, we'll see. Because at the end of the day, we, we didn't start as a cow's milk company and convert into something else. We have always been focused on mothers and babies uh, and see that that is the biggest leverage point to begin with. And it just so happens that a large proportion of the dairy industry, liquid dairy market end up in infant formula anyway. So it's kind of a double whammy that we get to have climate change implications. We get to try to become more neutral, um, but we don't have to hit consumers over the head with replacing everything all at once, which 
I always feel like sustainability products work best when you don't have to sell them on sustainability. You can sell them on personal yeah. benefit and they happen to do good by the planet. And in this case, you know, we don't, we don't talk about it at all with parents that this is a, a better climate option because they already experience such shame and stigma over the decision they're making from infant formula producers, from breast is best groups. And so why add another layer of uh, guilt in trying to make them make a decision? Let's just let them reap the positive benefits of making a decision that's better for their child that also happens to be better for the planet. Yeah, but there's, I mean, you know, you're not, you're not combining human epithelial cells with some kind of animal, I mean, so it's, it's all human all the way through, right? I mean, we're not we're all using human. any other animal. Yes, so no, yeah. So, okay. All right, good. So that, that's no, fine. We're, I think we're, right. yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I know there are other approaches groups take out there and, and there's other, you know, work being done. And there's definitely interesting things to learn from other cell lines and there's other cell based milks that I think we'd be interested in. But um, evolution does a really great job of engineering cells. Why, why try to do what nature hasn't in some ways is, is some of our opinion at this point. One more quick question. So the, Katika, before we, yeah, what, go for uh, it. Yeah. So um, interesting, uh, it's sort of the, the eek factor here, but how, do you, how does one actually know whether what you produce tastes like breast milk? <laughs> because I mean, it's been <laughs> a long time since I tried it. I mean, do, I mean, you can't have an infant taste it, can you? Do you remember the taste, Lavi? No, 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 I don't. But I'm just asking, <laughs> I mean, how, do you, how does one know at the end of the day that once all this is done, that actually that is like, breast milk. Uh, <laughs> so we talked to an interesting advisor actually who uh, has worked on hydrolyzed infant formula, which means they actually break down proteins into smaller peptides to be able to be digestible by infants that have different allergies. And he was like, have you ever tasted hydrolyzed infant formula? And I was like, no. And he's like, don't ever do it. It tastes awful. And we make adults eat it or where they used to in like large infant formula companies to do safety testing before they would of course feed it to babies. And uh, he was like, it's, it's terrible and babies still, still drink it. Um, so like babies palates, you know, they've, they've never been exposed to things to even know what taste is, right? You're programming right. some of their first learnings by what you feed them. Um, and so we're, we're not as concerned about making sure we hit gold standard for babies. I think babies are pretty forgiving, thank God. Unlike trying to make a steak or a piece of bacon, we have no gold standard and a consumer who has no idea what it tastes like, which is great. <laughs> um, but we do know, I mean, moms taste pretty much everything they put in their children's mouths, um, right. rightly so. And so, yeah, I mean, there's definitely a question of like, how should it taste? How should it appear? And uh, the good news is, I mean, in the, in the production methods we're able to use, it comes out as a full blended liquid. So we don't have to do any downstream modification, purification, processing, adaptation at all. Um, it, it in theory should taste exactly like how it would taste coming out of that mother's breast. So, uh, you know, it's funny. Everyone always is like, oh, there's this weird ick factor. And I'm like, there's only an ick factor because we've made it an ick factor in some ways, I think. Um, and so it's kind of, it's kind of a strange world that we you know, it's such a like taboo topic for even other mothers to talk about with each other. And I don't understand why, like it is maybe one of the most fundamentally um, experiences, uh, fundamental experiences that a human has that other humans have had. Yeah. In a world where we're like incredibly disconnected from each other. It is amazing to me that a, a, a woman, you know, 5,000 miles away has the exact same or very similar experience to another woman. And yet we talk about it like it's this strange weird world when it's I'll, really I'll give you a, I'll give you an interesting example of how strange things are when it comes to breasts so we were looking to promote this on both Facebook and LinkedIn well like we do normally do and you know both of them flagged the fact that we were using the word breasts yep. and so they refused to let us pay money to LinkedIn or Facebook to promote this show yep because Welcome of what breasts world. yeah isn't that insane Crazy. Totally insane. Totally insane. <laughs> totally insane. Yeah. And, Plus and the algorithms. The yeah, algorithms uh, kept caught them. All the so we made them breastless milk and that passed that. But then when it came to promoting it, <laughs> they got us. Yeah. No, it's it's um uh, it's crazy. And we'll and we'll talk I mean we talk to a lot of mothers right now, and it'll take I don't know, thirty minutes to warm up with a lot of moms before they can even mention their own breasts and breast milk. Like we have to like it's a lot of preamble to even get. It's just an incredibly personal experience. It's like a little embarrassing. We've sexualized so many components of the human woman experience. Mm -hmm. So like everyone thinks that they should be ashamed. And, um, you know, we look at these cells and they're like, 
it's so impressive and so disconnected from the human experience of shame that they will do what they're going to do. They're going to produce milk. They will produce it in inopportune times and women will leak. I mean, there's just so many amazing things that these cells do entirely independent of the human cognitive <laughs> ability uh, to some extent. And so it's, it's not worth being embarrassed by because it is truly nature. Yeah. 200 million years of evolution at work, right? Kathy, yeah. get a question? Yeah, actually. Um, something that everyone was really interested in when we spoke about having you on the show was how you managed to convince people like Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, and Mark Zuckerberg to invest in biomilk. So can you talk us through that process? Because a lot of startups and food tech companies are really interested to find out. Yeah. So one thing that's important to note is Breakthrough Energy Ventures has them all as founding partners, but like, it's not like I go golfing with Bezos. <laughs> also, I can't. <laughs> So that's a bad example, but uh, yeah, no, um, we, we've never met any of them personally. Like we don't hang out on yachts. I wish, but it's not a thing. Um, but we, so Breakthrough Energy Ventures, our lead of course has these, you know, billionaires focused on climate change prevention and moonshot ideas that they think can differentially reduce carbon emissions and, and reduce planetary outcomes. Um, and you know, if you had told me like, oh yeah, you're going to be funded by Breakthrough Energy Ventures when we started this journey, I would have been like, why? They should have no interest in us. But it was really clear as we were fundraising and trying to find mission aligned partners and people who cared as deeply about the implications of this technology and how importantly um, delicate it's going to have to be done, how nuanced and deft the activity around this product is going to have to be to create the change that it can have. I think they were a really obvious and logical partner. I mean, they take on these huge, huge, amazing, much more technologically advanced technologies than we're working on even, and try to figure out how to bring them to a world that's not ready yet because they're 25 years early. And in some ways that's what we're doing. And so we fit really beautifully in that we, we hit the climate targets in terms of reducing dairy consumption, in terms of reducing planetary outcomes because of animal welfare. But we also get to take on a gnarly problem that requires um, a lot of in intention and care and thought. And that's really their bread and butter is taking on these ideas that anyone else would be like, that is not a profitable business model. Are you insane? And they say, well, we're going to figure out how to make it profitable so that it can be good, that it can come to the world. So they can be a self-sustaining business. And uh, well, there are lots of people who are now interested in us, uh, I, I don't, I don't think anybody until it was signaled that somebody was willing to take a big bet on us, uh, yeah. truly could could believe in the potential the way Breakthrough Energy Ventures has for us. Fantastic. When um, when when does it when do you project commercial availability potentially? Uh, so we'll see. It kind of depends on the FDA. <laughs> those those yeah, okay. pesky pesky folks. Um, so I mean, technologically, we are working on optimization now. We're working on um, kind of you know, internal upregulation, cell line, bioreactor work, the usual stuff that a cell line company would. Um, but the longer question is breast milk is illegal to sell pretty much everywhere in the world. Uh, there is no standard of identity or government mandated definitions. Um, I was talking to someone this morning, even the World Health Organization <clears throat> has been trying to figure out common standards that, that could be implemented for milk banks of donated yeah. human milk. And it is so varied across the world that it is impossible to come up with a set of regulations that's truly comprehensive. And so we have this fascinating and challenging path ahead of us where we don't really fit into anything that has been brought to market for infants previously. Um, we are working with fundamentally safe and trusted production methods that have already been used in pharmaceutical production for years. Um, but it's an application on a product that no one's ever defined before. And that means that we're giving ourselves a lot of time to be able to get through the regulatory pathway and work and um, know that it will be a close collaboration to be able to come to market in, in, in the US and then beyond. Because you, you know, I like to say it should take a long time because you're feeding the most precious beings on the planet. Like you, you wouldn't wanna see a product come out for infants in a year. <laughs> like, I wouldn't feed that to my kids. Um, you know, you, you want to make sure that that rigor is there, the belief and the discussion and the argument has happened. Um, but that means that we're probably at least three to five years out from where we can bring a product to market comfortably and be as confident internally as consumers can be externally that this product is safe and effective and will support the life of their children. 
So three to five years is not that a long time, actually, when you consider the the amount, the insurmountable sometimes regulations and and uh, buy-in and everything else that one has to happen in a, in a brand new category, I guess. Um, yeah, well, we'll see. We say three to five years conservatively. I mean, who knows? Um, yeah, but yeah. I think we we realistically, so I've worked with the FDA on the food side and my co-founder came from pharma. So she has FDA experience there. Um, and you know, I think Salag always talks about the FDA like this boogeyman kind of, um, you FDA and USDA. And the, the core truth is they are scientists that want to do right and protect people. And so you really just have to speak their language. Yeah. Like you, yeah. you just have to figure out how you can share the right information to assuage their fears, assuage their concerns, um, build a very strong argument as to why this product will continue to be safe. And so um, you know, we, we relish and delight a little bit in being able to work with people as nerdy and focused as we are on trying to bring a product to market in the safest and most ethical manner possible. Yeah, and uh, speaking of the product, Michelle, uh, are you envisaging the product to be available in a liquid format or is that, is it also going to be powdered breast milk? We'll see. So we're letting consumers tell us that, I would say. At this point, my... Um, my hope is we can come to market in a full liquid pre-blend. You, you degrade quite a bit of nutritional value if you have to go through a heat step. Um, and so powdered well, it might be more convenient and fit more into consumer behavior today. I think you do lose some of the value of that beautiful constellation you've worked so hard to, to produce. Um, but we're not, we're not closing the door on anything. You know, we understand that parents, um, in terms of how they use the product and how they're habituated to expect the product to show up, have a lot of expectations. Um, and we want to make sure that we are in the right form and, and confirmation that it is usable and designed for them rather than designed for what we want. So we'll see. So we have product, a number of years to figure it out. <laughs> so the product is sort of has to be chilled just like uh, if you pump breast milk or something like that, is it? I mean, it, it's uh, obviously has a shelf life that's limited in, uh, initially. We'll see. We're perfect. working on some of that in, internally now. I mean, there are other milks throughout the world that are uh, packed in manners that allow them to be shelf stable um, and still main, maintain some nutritional quality. So I think there are paths that we're exploring. That's where I finally get to use my dairy science, which is always fun when people ask me a question where I'm like, this is a science question that's mine instead of Layla's. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, there's opportunities to consider coming to market where you could be transported in a liquid blend and not require refrigeration. A little harder, a little longer, a little more expensive, but maybe worthwhile if you could maintain that nutritional quality. So wow. when when mothers come to you to build custom milk for them by donating their cells and things like that, how long is the lactation process? For example, if somebody is already pregnant, how how earlier do they have to custom order the the milk? Yeah, we think about six weeks at this point um, is about the turnaround. Uh, where we could produce quantifiable milk that could be shipped direct to door. So we're starting in a D to C manner. Um, you know, there are other companies that are looking at more like a, a SaaS model, as they call it, which I is licensing, but you know. Um, and so we see that going direct to parents, being able to let them be empowered and make their own decision and, and purchase the product directly in a custom to start and then long term in a, in a non custom or mass milk form. Um, parents are already making a lot of their purchasing decisions for their children online. We see HIP or HALA infant formulas that are illegal here in the US. They've, they've not been um, approved, but uh, are GMO free US or grass fed uh, based out of Europe that parents are already buying that online and having it shipped to their home. And that's similar price point, similar market to what we will initially enter at. So um, we see that that behavior is already there and, and really like kind of removing the middlemen so that we can get the best product possible directly to our consumer rather than worrying about huge advertising spend or brokers or distribution in the same manner. Okay, so does the, uh, the custom milk blend process creation also have to be FDA approved? Well, pardon me if I'm asking a dumb question. <laughs> no, 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 that's okay. Uh, yeah, every, every product that you're going to sell to a consumer um, has to go through FDA approvals in the U.S. Um, any, any food product or supplement product. There's different varying levels depending on what's in it and how well known it is and how safe or unsafe it, the regulators feel it could be. But um, yeah, I mean, it's regardless of what we, we do, it's gonna have to go through FDA regulatory. And um, you know, people ask, well, why not go through a different agency, right? There are other countries that are faster or more efficient or uh, might be more aligned to trying to move food tech faster. And 
what I would argue is um, we are trying to make a product that's going to be accessible to the most children possible as quickly as possible. And right now, whether it's fair or not, the stamp of approval of the FDA has long ranging ramifications and quality indicators for much of the world. And so if you really want parents to believe and trust and know that your product is safe, even if it takes longer and is more of a tortuous path, it's worth it to be able to prove that to them. And, and that stamp today, whether it should be or not, is the American FDA system. Yeah, yeah that's true. Kathy, any more questions? Oh, yeah, actually, I had one. I was interesting when I was doing the research for this, Michelle, I noticed that a lot of moms in Africa are like HIV positive and can't breastfeed their babies and things like that. Is that an area that you think biomilk can address? Yeah, so you've touched on my like, what keeps me up at night problems. Um, technology is solvable. People problems are messy, but solvable. Access is where I get stressed because I do not want our product just to end up in the hands of wealthy families that already are going to have advantaged babies and only feed the elite <laughs> kind, of, kind of world, which unfortunately is where Cell Ag has to start. And you know, to make a sustainable business model, you have to have an audience that's able to pay at the prices we're gonna be working down from. But um, access is something we, we worry about a lot and think really deeply about how do we get to the infants that need this product most. So in our first custom model, we know we're actually going to be producing more than the average mother is going to need. Um, and so we'll have an opt-in function to be able to donate the remainder of your milk to be used by aid agencies. Um, and so the intent on that is it's, it's pretty consumptive to produce this milk. Um, throwing it away <laughs> because you don't need it would be, would be incredibly wasteful. Uh, and there are millions of babies who are experiencing you know, war-torn regions, famine, microbial or bacterial contamination in breast milk. Uh, or infant formula. And so getting to those infants is important to us. But also here in, in other parts of the developed world where we see access because of racial inequality or systemic racism or um, institutionalized kind of patterns of behavior of socioeconomic status, others given formula instead of being encouraged. We also are thinking about how do we get creative in utilizing either um, benefit systems or utilizing health insurance or thinking through other methods of delivery so that we can actually get into the hands as quickly as possible of moms who really, really need this product. Um, and I don't have an answer there. I always, I love and hate this question because my answer is, I don't know. Yeah. This is like trying to take on the whole world at once, but it's something that we think about a lot. And I hope that that brings some um, comfort to anyone who would have that concern that like, we too are worried about it. Don't worry, we're thinking about it, we're working on it. and. Um, we will make sure that whatever we do, we can try to get as quickly as possible into the hands of mothers who need this. But in some sense, um, uh, in terms of the factory unit or the bioreactors themselves, I mean, um, it's like a little microbrewery, right? I mean, you could have them sort of scale down to, I'm, I'm, I may be oversimplifying, but but <laughs> I know on the cell meat side, that's what they tell me, right? That so, you know, you could you could have your like your own little microbrewery every, you know, in, in small pl pl places. I don't know whether that applies to the biomilk uh, product and, and the regulations affected by it, but th theoretically you don't need, you know, 20,000 or a million square feet of factory space to sort of produce this stuff. Uh, so maybe in that scaling, you probably could get a, a better model for access. I mean, at least that's, that's, that's something to think about. We'll see. Uh, our technology is a bit more challenging to transport and operate than a fermenter or like a stirring batch tank. Okay. Um, and it, then you get down to, again, I mean, the, the, the bigger question is if everything requires regulatory approval in whatever country you're producing in and has different rules, different restrictions. Again, we're feeding babies, so we got to be careful. And yeah. so it's just harder to control a process the more you translate that process to other places. So Long term, yeah, I think we definitely, you know, if you're going to try to feed feed the world with a product like this, you're not going to try to produce it all in one country and ship it. Um, right. But it's it's not as easy as like, I wish you could just drop a bioreactor in every city in the country and be done. And it's it's not quite, doesn't quite look like that. Which on a side tangent, some of the work I did at Gates was around thinking through kind of um, what are some of these scalable alternative plant-based proteins that can be produced in challenging regions to produce throughout the world, mm -hmm. um, especially where we see high levels of stunting and wasting and, and over and under nutrition. Um, 
And so there's a lot of technologies that I think will will get there. And uh, I hope you're having some of them on your show because I think that there's some really cool stuff out there that can really have massive malnutrition um, fighting capability that I am super supportive of and hope we can cheer on from from the side. Well, sure. send, send us a list and we will be, we'll, we'll come back. I make sure you ask for it. There yeah. were a lot of companies that I worked really closely with that I'm sure now, it's, it's strange how much happens in a year because I'm, at that time I was like at the Gates Foundation asking them questions and now they're like, what the heck is Michelle doing? So it, it's a strange little world where once you start to get sucked in, you just kind of get really down the rabbit hole to some extent. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, we were fascinated when I first saw this um, news hit that, you know, the adults got, you know, Beyond Burgers and Impossible and Just Eggs and, you know, all this cool stuff that's coming out, right? Uh, and then, you know, the babies suddenly, you know, it just dawned on me, my God, you know, when you think of putting the planet on a pandemic diet, we were only thinking of adults. And then here comes Michelle and Le Leila with this brilliant idea of sort of, hey, what about the infants? What about all of you when you were uh, a lot smaller? And I think, you know, it's brilliant that, you know, you've sort of come up with this, uh, this area that, you know, frankly was neglected. I mean, why, why let the, you know, the first six months of a baby's life is a lot more important uh, than people care to admit. So I think, you know, fixing that nutritional deficit uh, is huge. I mean, that, that could make for a smarter population in general, right? I mean, a healthier population in general. I mean, that's the impact. I mean, I, I'm, now I see why Gates, you know, this moonshot thing uh, comes about because, you know, this is talking about significantly changing the lives of millions of people all over the world. I, I think that's, it's amazing that you guys are doing what you're doing and we're thrilled that, uh, you know, you've been sort of candid and generous with all your, your answers as well. Uh, just a note on that. One of the things I'm most proud of is, is kind of meta, which is, um, I think it's pretty rare that you get to work on a technology where you might actually be feeding the inventors of new technology. So I like to think about like, are we feeding the future Einsteins of the world? Uh, are we able to, are, are we going to advantage kids who otherwise may not have developed to their full potential to now like, this is a cool innovation. What we're doing is applying some really cool tech that will have long-term ramifications, but like, what can we, what will we never know that we've unlocked out of the human psyche and ability by just getting children, the infant nutrition products that they deserve. And that's like the little, like being in a weird sci-fi movie, but I, I kind of love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's awesome. Um, we had uh, Dr. Sanjay Sriram of She of Meats, another super woman in the food tech space, obviously Michelle. And she said when she's growing her shrimp cells that they do it in like a nutrient dense sort of a liquid. Is that sort of the similar thing that happens with these epithelial cells or is it a completely different, uh, you know, uh, process? It's, so it's pretty different. We're, um, these cell types, because they're epithelial cells, they like to stick to something, they're adherent cells. Um, so we're using a bioreactor form that enables them to have a lot of surface area to stick to rather than being like stirred in a bunch of media or, or nutrients. Um, and in the body, mammary epithelial cells line the mammary gland. So they're able to create this layer, which keeps blood on one side, pulls in the nutrients and then produces milk out the other, never intermixing the two. And that's really kind of the fundamental difference of this technology is if, if you had to try to um, filter out media, filter out cells, uh, go through any kind of downstream purification or separation, milk is incredibly complicated, probably one of the most complicated fluids in the world that's produced by, uh, by cells. And um, you wouldn't actually be able to create the full nutritional equivalency if you had to do any of that kind of processing or adaptation. And so that's kind of the, I hate to use it, but the secret sauce of this, of this technology in the space is that if you tried to grow these cells in the way meat cells or shrimp cells are being grown today, um, you, you don't have anything to remove because we don't care about the cells. We care about the product that product. they produce. You know, we're more like um, shepherds rather than like uh, Angus beef cattle raisers, <laughs> more or less. So it, it's, it's a bit different in kind of the approach that you take. But do you feed wow. it any external nutrients at all or? Yeah. Yep. So we still have to, yeah, we still have to feed it external nutrients. Um, like the human body, it needs a lot of glucose to be happy. We all need sugar in our lives. Um, and then um, there's the reason female cells lactate is because they receive hormones developed by the human female body, not the male body yeah. typically that come from the pituitary gland. Um, and so we have to add back a few of those, those hormones that naturally occur in the woman's body to, to stimulate. stimulate lactation. Yeah. Um, but other than that, I mean, these, 
these cells, it's amazing to me that we haven't used mammary epithelial cells earlier for a number of things because they're really prolific, they're really resilient, um, and they already are engineered by nature to be incredibly biosynthetic. Wow. Yeah. So I think we are at, we are at the hour uh, time frame. So I, I don't want to take too much of Michelle's time because I know she's she's got lots of other things to do. Um, I, it's been absolutely fascinating, Michelle. I, I I think we've got a few comments from people saying uh, that it's it's been an, uh, a superb session for them. Um, so thank you so much for sort of enlightening us. Uh, I think you made a, a couple of us just take a step back, especially on the, on the male cells there. <laughs> I'm still chewing through that. <laughs> <laughs> so technically Lavi can produce breast milk. That's what's scaring him. That's yeah. great. I mean, you know, it's, it was, you know, it, maybe that's what finally gets all this old talk about breast out of the, you know, because men can do it as well. I mean, you know, maybe it's not, such a mysterious thing anymore, you know? Exactly. If, if men don't have to wear shirts in public and we can use their breast tissue, who knows what's next for women, man? Yeah. But you know, this whole sci-fi thing, it's amazing, right? I mean, we've had um, you know, sort of we, people on the, on the all protein side, you know, from cell based meats and eggs and everything else. And, uh, you know, there's a sort of a theological philosophical argument around, you know, religious prohibitions on food, right? I mean, you're talking about things like kosher, halal, you know, Hindu vegetarian, I mean, all of this stuff, right? And, and you know, we're really sending the, the, the theologians sort of back to the source to figure out, is this stuff now eatable? I mean, is, can, can a Hindu eat beef that's made with cruelty free? I mean, what, is, what are the real theological sort of challenges there, right? I think, you know, science is really upending a lot of these sort of debates that people have had for centuries, right? And thousands of years in some cases. And I think in, this is a classic example of something else, right? That we're actually making, you know, breast milk, which is uh, sort of the key component of somebody, uh, you know, get, getting to adulthood without which, you know, you can't survive uh, outside the body. I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it's you know, sort of almost like godlike and science sci-fi like. I mean, it's amazing where science is taking us. And I, uh, you know, I applaud you for sort of taking on this journey, both uh, my congratulations to both you and Leila on, on, on doing this. And thank you for coming on the show and enlightening a, a whole bunch of us um, on this. And, and you've made, by the way, science really easy to understand. So w we thank you for that as well. So. <laughs> You're I was, I was going to say, when you say godlike, I think to myself all the times, science has slapped me in the face with my lack of understanding. So I think it's always important to know, especially in this cell ag world, you know, everyone looks to the scientific advance and thinks like, wow, we just know so much. And I, I think science teaches you more about what you don't know than what you do. And we at BioMill take that very seriously, that there's a lot that we probably don't understand. And so how can we be good stewards of science? Because science is a cruel mistress. She rarely uh, responds the way you expect her to. <laughs> And I mean, and something is so, so I mean, we, we say, oh, breast milk. I mean, you know, it does. And you just told us like how complex it is and how sort of hard it is even for the best of science to do, right? I mean, so, and that the substitute that people have been feeding their infants obviously is, is terrible, uh, comparatively speaking. And, uh, and so, yeah, I think uh, you're right. I think nature always in, in our own biology sort of impresses us more than we care to admit, right? So <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. It was great to great spend some Thank you, Michelle. And we'll introduce you to a few more superwomen. Please do. Please do. Yes. We, we need our we need our little superwoman network here. <laughs> yeah, I think my uh, my LinkedIn invitation to you is pending. So please go ahead and uh, do that. And I'll I'll hook you on to Benjamin <laughs> and everybody else. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Thanks, All right. Michelle. Thank All you, right. guys. Have a Thanks great again, night. Michelle. Have a great okay. weekend. Bye.